Thank you so much. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your presence. God, uh, that we can just think as soon as we open our eyes in the morning. Lord, you're here. Thank you. And then to hear from you what's the plan for the day. And then with excitement to get to see that it wasn't really about us doing it. It was to see you in action. And then like our good daddy, at the end of the day, you're going to ask us, what do you think? We did a lot today, huh? And we praise you. We thank you. And we ask now that we open our Bibles, that you will please continue to teach us, mold us and shape us to be the church you want us to be. And Father, in a good day, when we praise you and we thank you, remind us that it's all because of your grace. It's all because of your grace. And we will continue to praise you, and we will always be careful to give you all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in your Bibles, in the book of Romans, today we get to finish chapter 8. How about that, huh? Yeah, we will. We've been in chapter 8 for what, two years or something? <clears throat> but today we get to finish it. And the title for our message this morning is No Separation. No Separation. And I want to really take my time with this because, uh, like I said many times, chapter 8 Chapter 8 in the book of Romans is one of the most foundational chapters in your walk as a Christian. It is fundamental. It is foundational. So <clears throat> a good understanding of chapter 8 is going to help us tremendously as we go through life and we try to navigate through difficulties and pain and change and all of those things that we deal with. So no separation. We are going to be in verses 35, actually 31 to 39. <laughs> but we are going to really develop uh, verse 35 to 39. But we're going to read the other verses. Because as we come to the end of chapter 8, we are going to be finishing in your outlines the subject of sanctification. Beginning in chapter 6, chapter 7, and chapter 8, they all deal with the subject of sanctification. Before that, we finish the subject of justification by faith. Now, it is important that you remember this, justification by faith, sanctification by faith, and then the provision of God, the provision of His Holy Spirit, the provision of His Word, and all the other things that He is going to do. At the end of chapter 8, well, towards the end, Paul is going to say this. He's going to say, for I am persuaded, and different translations have it, I am persuaded, I am convinced, I am sure, I am certain that these things are true. Now, how can you and I have the same conviction? How can we, the church, here in 2023, have the same conviction of saying, I am persuaded, I am convinced, I am sure, I am certain that these things are true. What things? What things? That all these things that we have been studying, but one phrase, it will compact all of that in this. I am Persuaded, I am convinced that nothing in all the universe can separate us from the love of God. That you are persuaded of that. That I am convinced of that. That's the foundation of your Christian walk. Nothing in all the universe can separate the people of God from the love of God. Please remember that. In difficult times, in times of agony, in times of distress, in times of tribulation, in times of pain, in times of death, in times of sorrow, in times of grieving, remember that. Nothing in all the universe can separate the people of God from the love of God. And what are the grounds for this persuasion? Well, in chapter 8, we've been talking about the security of the believer. How can we say as believers that we are secure in Christ Jesus? That's the first verse of chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. How can we say that the security of the believer has to do with being in Christ and not with personal performance? And that's the whole point of chapter 8. And I'm going to give you here a couple of things. The security of the believer is a reality. The security of the believer is indeed fact, not fiction. Why? 
Three things. The security of the believer has to do with this. Number one, the security of the believer is given to us by the presence of the Holy Spirit in the believer. Chapter 8, beginning in verse 1, all the way to 17. Chapter 8, 1 to 17, has to do with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that was given to the believer at the time of, remember this, at the time of, when you come to Jesus, when you by faith believe in the work of salvation, the, the work of <laughs> redemption, at that moment, you receive Jesus, but you receive the Spirit that also indwells you, and He will be with you forever. That's one of the promises in the, in the New Testament. So at the time of regeneration, when you are born again, you receive the Spirit that is abiding in you always. You might grieve Him, you might quench Him, but He's not leaving you. You have to understand this, because if you don't, you're going to be up and down, up and down, up and down, like, oh, today I am a believer. No, tomorrow I'm not a believer. In a moment I'm a believer. No, 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 no. What is going to be hurt, what is going to get hurt when you fall into sin? Listen, what is going to get hurt when you fall into sin is your communion with Him, not your position in Him. You understand that? Your position in Him, no one can change that. As far as God is concerned, you are already glorified. Remember that? You are already glorified. Though practically, you're still here, and we're going to make a mess of things. Well, not you. I do. You're wonderful people. You never do things like that. So the security of the believer, number one, has to do with the presence of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 8, verse 1 to 17. Secondly, it's not only given by the presence of the Holy Spirit, but it's grounded in our hope for future glory. We know where we are heading. I know where I'm going. I definitely know where I'm going. In Panama, years ago, you know, I'm driving there. I, I was in Panama for eight years, and in eight years, I was never able to get a driver's license in Panama. They make it practically impossible for you to have a, uh, get a driver's license in Panama. So I was driving with my California driver's license. And one day they pulled me over. <laughs> and they said, driver's license. And then I gave him my California. He says, no, Panamanian driver's license. I don't have one. Well, get out of the vehicle. We're going to take you. I go like, OK. And so he says, do you have any form of ID? Sure. And my California driver's license, my Mexican passport. <laughs> do you have a valid form of ID? Sure, the church in Panama had made me a card that said, this is so-and-so, he's the pastor of the church, so-and-so, and so-and-so. So I pulled that out. <laughs> you're driving with a California driver's license, you're a Mexican, and you're a Panamanian pastor. What else do you have? I got something else. Oh, my faith in Christ Jesus. Where are you from? I go like, you know what? I don't even remember. But I do know where I'm going. You want to know? I go, I know you want to know. I'm going to heaven. By the sacrifice that Jesus went to the cross of Calvary, he paid for my sin. And because of his precious blood, he paid for my redemption. I, am, I have been set free. He paid for my redemption. I am his, and I'm going to heaven. You want to know how you go there? He says, here, get out of here. Get out of here. <laughs> But it's important that you know these things. The security of the believer, number one, is given by the presence of the Holy Spirit. It is grounded in your hope of future glory. And number three, it's guaranteed by the facts of God's word. This is not fiction. We're not talking about some book. This is historical. I mean, this is indeed the word of God. And when, we, when you read this, you are reading facts. This is not fiction. This is not fables. What it, what it has to do with the facts of God's word? Number one. That the Holy Spirit is praying for you, verses 26 to 27. That God has a purpose for you, verses 28 and 30. That God promised uh, several things to you, verses 31 to 34. One of the things that he promised is that he is for you. And because he is for you, who can be against you? Secondly, in his promise, not only he promised to protect you, but he promised to provide for you. And he already validated that when he said, if I have given you the greatest thing ever that you needed, which is Christ Jesus to die for your sin, God says, don't you think I'm going to give you everything else? 
So he promised to protect you. He promised to provide for you. And when you fail, when you make mistakes, which we continue to do, he says that he promised to pardon your sin. So you have his protection, you have his provision, the pardon of your sin. And then on top of that, you have Jesus who is interceding for you daily, all day long. So here is the thing. The security of the believer given by the presence of the Holy Spirit, grounded in the hope of future glory, guaranteed by the facts of God's word, the prayer of the Spirit, the purpose of God, the promise of God, his protection, his provision, his pardon. Fourth, and this is the thing that's going to occupy our time here. Not only he promised that you have the prayer of the Spirit, that God has a purpose, that, that He promised to do all these things, but then there's the power of God's love. And that's what is going to occupy our rest, the rest of our time here. Why? Because you have to be able to answer in the positive when I ask you this. Are you persuaded of these things? Yes. Let's pray again, Father. And then... <laughs> Paul gets to the point in his life, after he writes all of these things, he comes to the end of chapter 8 and says, I am persuaded. I am convinced. There's not a doubt in my mind nor in my heart. I am persuaded. Of what? I am persuaded that nothing can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And you've got to have that persuasion. You've got to have that conviction. Because if you're not certain, it's because one thing and one thing only. If you are questioning your salvation, if you don't have a certainty of your salvation, if you're not persuaded, if you're not fully convinced, that's because you're looking at you rather than be looking at Jesus. Because you know that you fail you more often than you want to really admit. And that's the truth for all of us. But if you want to be really truly convinced, you have to take a good look at Jesus Christ. And when you do, then you will be able, like Paul, to say, I am now fully convinced. Now, let's read some of these verses here. Chapter 8, <clears throat> verse 31. What then should we say to these things? If God is for us, or, or actually, since God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely, freely, freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Actually, I want to take a couple of seconds here to touch a little bit on that. Because it is important. Who should bring a charge against God's elect? We talked about last week about Satan and the strategies of Satan. And we know what he does. You know how he takes the word of God and he twists the truth of that. Of that to make you question God's goodness, and to make you question whether you are his or not. And he's doing all of this. It's always the same, the same strategy. But we know how we overcome him. Remember? By the blood of the Lamb, by the word of testimony, and by not steaming our lives above anything, but to be in the presence of God Almighty if our life was to be taken from us. No problem. Once you do that, Here's the thing that I want to spend a, just a few seconds on this. And the reason I want to say this is because it is kind of sad and it's kind of tragic how so much of this accusation takes place in the church of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to mention the world because that's what they do. That's how they are. But it's so sad that within the church we still have this issue of trying to help the devil. The devil is the accuser. It should be no place for that in the Christian church, in, in the community of believers, in the family of believers. It should be no place for that. We should have never, never, never the, 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 the sense of going to church and, you know, uh, that person or these or whatever. Don't ever admit accusations against anybody within the body of Christ. For nobody anyway. And don't ever fall into this thing of accusing someone. Because, you know, that's the devil's work. He, he doesn't need any help. We ought to be careful that we are edifying one another, that we are helping one another, that we are protecting one another. That you love one another in a way that, that I cannot see the minimum of stain on that brother or that sister. And I cannot take anything that is hurtful or that is going to destroy their character. Who cares about the reputation but the character? we got to be careful with that. We have to be careful. Read James chapter 3. And I'm saying that because I know it doesn't happen here with us. But we got to be careful. 
you, you start getting into these things, even, even among us pastors, and, 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 and I mean, sometimes we are, you know, praying and talking, and before you know, we're talking about this and that and that, and like, yeah, but this and that. Lord, please forgive me. I don't want to fall in the game of accusing people. We got to be careful. We are always to be edifying one another, loving one another. It is when we love one another that they will know that we are his disciples. See, and you have to be careful that you are quick to admit your own wrongdoing rather than quick to accuse someone else for some things that sometimes we don't even know. May the Lord help us never to fall in the business of accusing others. Even if they are wrong, that's between them and God. That's their problem. And they have to bring that before the Lord. Remember, you don't ever want to be guilty of accusing those whom Jesus is defending. You don't want to fall into that. You don't want to be accusing those whom God already justified. He is the supreme judge of all the universe. Why? Because we have his protection, his provision, his pardon, his prayer. We ought to be living life in a way that is honoring to him. And, and, and let this other business up to others. But I say that is because in verse 34 says, who is he who condemns? Who is going to condemn us if we are keeping ourselves from doing that kind of stuff? And the thing is, no one. The, the, the answer to that, no one. Who is he who condemns? And notice what it says is, it is Christ who died. And furthermore, also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Previously, the Spirit is making intercession for us. Here, Jesus is making intercession for us. When? Daily. All day long. So, Jesus said of himself, he says, The Father has given all authority to the Son. So, if he is sitting at the right hand of the Father, and he has received all authority, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, he says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And if this is true, and it is, because it is the word of God, then who is he who condemns? Jesus is the judge. But at the same, listen, at the same time, not only he's the judge that he's going to judge the whole world, he is also your defender, your advocate. He's, he, he's interceding for you. And so he paid it all. No one can condemn you. No one. The one who's the judge is there to intercede for it. For, for you, for us, for all of us. Now, after that, we then we come to this verse 35. And I'm going to read all those verses, 35 to 39, okay? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet... In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Don't ever quote that verse saying, we are more than conquerors. You have to quote the whole thing. Through him who loved us. Because if it's not through him, you can conquer nothing. It's not because of who you are that you're a conqueror. No, it's not because of what you do. It's not because of what you know. No, we're only more than conquerors when it is in him. What does Philippians chapter 4 says? I can do. So, in, in, in this thing, we have to be clear. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And the reason we are more than conquerors is because he first loved us. And because he loved us, then we're going to get to see what else he already accomplished for us. Verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That, now we come to the last of these facts in God's word, and it is the amazing love of God. The amazing power of the love of God. We already have his promise to protect us, to provide, and to pardon us. And we have Jesus who's interceding. He's praying for us daily. So you have all these promises, and then you have all the help from Jesus. You have the interceding of the Holy Spirit, and you have the truth of the Word of God. Then what? When all of that is real, all of that, the reason why all of that is true, and it is a reality in your life, is because God loves you. 
God loves you. He loved you before. He loves you and he will forever love you because his love for you is unending. You have to always bring that balance. It's not because God is good. Yeah, he is good and he is all of that. It's not just because he is holy. It's because all of his attributes, and we, we learned that when we learned the attributes of God. Because of all his attributes, they never operate independent of one another. And just because he is righteous, he is also love. He is grace. He is mercy. And you have to always remember that. Because then when you read verse 35, you can actually read it like this. Who or what? The same word can be used uh, interchangeable. Who or what can separate us from the love of Christ? And what is the premise for that? It's verse 37. What is verse 37? In all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So who can separate you from him? No one. Absolutely no one. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And how are we conquerors? Two things here. And maybe we don't, we're not going to like this thing, but this is the way it is. How is it that we are more than conquerors? Number one, because trials make you stronger, not weaker. Trials are to make you better, not bitter. So when difficulties, when pain, when sorrow, when affliction, when grieving comes to you, even that, remember what it says, and we know that all things work together for, for who? For those? Yes. And now we know that. This is factual truth. This, this is indeed the truth of the word of God. Then what? Then this trial, this suffering, this affliction that I'm going through right now can only make me stronger. Secondly, not only the trials make you stronger, not weaker. Secondly, Trials will force you to cry out to God for help. How many things you go through everyday life and you don't bother asking God for help? When you have a headache, do you pray for your headache or do you take a Tylenol? And there are a lot of things in life that because we think that we're, ah, eh, they're little things, they're not insignificant things. We have, to go, we have to go to God for little things and for great things. You know why? Because the combination of both little and great things is called dependency. We are depending on our Father. Why? Because we cannot figure it out. Oh, no, you can. But the results, if you figure it out, the results are your responsibility. You want to be responsible for your result? No more. And so, number one, trials will make you stronger and trials will force you to cry out to God to be your strength and, to, and sometimes just to be your place of refuge. There are some times when you're going to find yourself, listen, to, listen, there are some times when you're going to find yourself asking for strength and sometimes you're just going to ask, Lord, be my refuge as we navigate the storm in, 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 in this season. Turn in your Bibles, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to give you a few verses here. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. <clears throat> and I'm going to give you the illustration on how these things are applied to everyday life. Trials will make you stronger, and trials will, will force you to cry out for help and strength and refuge. Chapter 12, you're there? Verse 8, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8. Paul is asking about some torn in his flesh. And he says, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Verse 9, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in what? Therefore... Most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ might rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am. Amen. Amen. Trials will make you stronger. And trials will force you to cry out for help. Turn now to 1 Peter chapter 5. 
Peter's going to tell us a couple of things here to complement that which we previously read. 1 Peter 5, you there? Verse 6, you there? Dun, 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 dun. Here we go. 1 Peter 5, verse 6, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, be sober. Do not allow anything to corrupt your state of mind. Do not allow any intoxicating agent. The worst of those is pride. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he might devour. Now here we go. Resist him. Steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. And then he's going to give you four things here. Notice. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. Doesn't that sound like Romans 8? But, the, but may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus... After you have suffered a while, uh, we don't like that part. After you have suffered a while, four things. Number one, he is perfecting you. Number two, he is establishing you. Number three, he is strengthening you. And number four, he is settling you down. Isn't that amazing? Now let me give you a little bit of these four different points here. Why? Because you and I, we make the mistake to think that Christian life is our part to do. And let me tell you something. Real Christianity always begins with God, not with us. It is sustained by God, not by us. Your final triumph is going to be about God, not you. Christian life begins with God, and God sustains that. That's the mistake we, many of us Christians make. I have to be this. I have to be that. I have to do this. Stop it. You're just making a mess. Your Christianity is God. Who is, my Christianity is God. My Christianity is Jesus. He gives it to me. He sustains that. And he's taking it. He's leading it. The moment your Christianity depends on you, you already made a mess. And here's the point why he's saying this. The God of all grace is also the God of hope. The God of all grace is also the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Sometimes he's going to rescue you, and sometimes he's just going to strengthen you. He just told you here. You're going to suffer for a little while, and he's walking with you. you. One thing is, if you're in Christ, you will never suffer alone. And I know a lot of us tend to think like that, because suffering is, is weird, is, is, is really bad. Nobody cares. Nobody's with me. Look, everybody's having a great time. They're all laughing. They're all enjoying. They all have families. They all have this. They all, that. They all have everything. I'm here just a miserable me, 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 me. No. And not denying that your pain is not horrible. Not denying that your suffering is not extreme. But I tell you what. I tell you one who's suffering a million times more than you. And that's your father in heaven who by the way, he's, he, he's holy. He's perfect. You, the Christian, you never suffer alone. So number one, in your suffering, he might be doing the work of perfecting you. What is to perfect you? Is to adjust you, to fit you, to finish, or to fit you in a way that you are joined together, or to mend you, or to repair you. How many times your suffering has to do with God shaping you so that you fit in his plan? But from your perspective, your, hor your, your, your suffering is horrible. And God says, I'm just trying to make you fit in my plan. Secondly, not only he is making you fit into his plan, but he's establishing you. It, that is to make a firm or solid foundation to, to, to set fast or to fix firmly in a place to stabilize you by providing support so that you will not totter, so that you're not but that you're firm, you're solid. Isn't that amazing? God is allowing suffering. So he wants to make you a solid woman of faith, a solid man of faith. 
Thirdly, not only perfecting you, establishing you, but he's strengthening you. And this has to do with God giving you strength to bear all of your suffering without wavering in your faith. There's never a moment when you say like, okay, that's it. I'm done. I don't want to play. Game over. I'm out. No, 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 no. You're working through these things, and you're going through these things. God is suffering with you, and God is leading you. God is taking you. He's your strength. And he's bearing the pain and the suffering of your heart. And the fourth thing here, not only he's perfecting you, he's establishing you, he's strengthening you, but he is going to settle you. And I like this. It's a foundation that lies beneath the place to secure you, to make you a permanent, secure person. Ah, what a beautiful thing this is. So Paul says, hey, listen, when I am weak, then I am strong. And when I am like wobbly and all of that, God becomes my strength. He settles me. He establishes me. And he continues to fit me or sometimes to mend me or to repair me until I fit perfectly in his plan. Do you ever pray like that? Lord, I need a little more adjusting, a little more. No. That's a foreign idea to our hearts, isn't it? Turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy, please. 2 Timothy chapter 4. We see that in the application of real life. From the same brother who gave us Romans. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And this is an amazing passage here. Amen? 2 Timothy 4, verse 6. Paul says this. This, is, this was, it is believed that it was shortly before he was actually executed. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I finished the race. I have kept the faith. This is the same guy who says, we are more than conquerors, Okay. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. Finally, there is laid out for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who love his appearing. Verse 14, same chapter. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. Verse 15 to Timothy says, You also, Timothy, must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. Verse 16, what does verse 16 says? I'm at my first, what? At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. You see that? Verse 17, but the Lord stood with me. And what did he do? He strengthened me. So that the message might be preached fully through me. And that all the Gentiles might hear also. I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. What do you say to that? Amen. This is the same brother who gave us Romans 8. You read about his life. I mean, when you start reading Corinthians and you see all the stuff that he went through, this, this brother, he's not making it up. And, and this is the same brother who kept insisting, like, Paul, I have a plan for you. I want to go back to Jerusalem. Uh, I have different plans. I'm going back to Jerusalem. He goes back to Jerusalem, and then he goes back. And then he finds himself sitting in prison one day. I imagine, and this is just me, that he's like, why did I, why didn't I listen to him? Why did I do that? I, oh, I failed miserably. And all of a sudden, again, this is me. The hand of someone is on his shoulder. And he says, Paul, be of good cheer. Just as you have testified of me, it is important. It is important. It is needed that you go and testify of me in Rome also. Be of good cheer. And this is the brother who says, hey, listen, we have a future and a hope. That God has promised to us and our future takes us beyond the grave. You believe that? 
Your future, you have a future and a hope. That's what the Bible says. And your future and your hope takes you beyond the grave. The grave is not the end for the Christian. It is in Christ Jesus that we are more than conquerors. We just don't get out of the difficulty. We don't get out of the suffering. We go through the suffering and we get to our final destination because he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world trying to stop you. And that is basically what Romans 8 is all about. And if you're suffering, if our suffering, uh, if our suffering was to take our life, so be it. We're still more than conquerors. Amen? And this is what the Bible says. And this is what it's all about. Let me read a few verses to you in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You don't have to go there. Let me just read it to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 16 says this. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Well, we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For we know, we are certain about this. Hmm. We are persuaded about this. We are convinced about this. That if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. If indeed have it been clothed, we should not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality might be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident. There you go again. We are always under the conviction. We are always confident. We are always persuaded. Knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident. Yes, well, please, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And that is life from God's perspective for his children. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. The power of God's love is amazing. Once you start learning and reading and all of these things, it's awesome. Don't make the mistake of thinking just because God loves you so much that that. that that you're not going to go through difficulties. Or because God loves you so much, you're gonna, he's going to immediately pull you out of the problem that you're in. In this context, actually, in Romans chapter 8, God uses what appears to be defeat. Ask the world about these things. And that's what the world sometimes says. I don't want to be a Christian. Are you supposed to suffer? And are you supposed to go through this and die if necessary? I don't want to be a Christian. Yeah, Christianity is not for cowards. Christianity is not for chickens. Christianity is for brave men and women who says, take my life, so what? I know where I'm going. And I have trusted in him. And I know him. And I know he's able to preserve me for that day. That's what Paul says to Timothy. The key is to think less about the power of things over you. And to think more and more about the power of God's love for you. Uh, because God has a purpose. What is the purpose? To ultimately conform you to the image of his beloved son. You're not there yet. Look around and you will know for sure that we're not there yet. But hey, I tell you, God is conforming you to the image of Jesus Christ. If you think that you're beautiful right now, and you are, wait until you see people in heaven. You will be in shock. You'll be like, oh, he made it? She made it. Oh, my God. And they are beautiful. They're awesome. Yep, that's what is for you. Let me, let me give you three things to remember. Please, if you, if you can write these things, please do it. God's great love for us is not diminished or terminated by your mistakes, shortcomings, or sins. Your problems, your sins, your, your, your failure do not ever diminish or terminate God's love for you. Second, God's great love for you is not threatened or undermined by any type of adversity. Any type of adversity. Notice what he says here. Verse 38. It's actually verse 35 at the end. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? 
So tribulation? No. Distress? No. Persecution? No. Famine? Never. Nakedness? Peril or sword? No. Tribulation is pressure from without. Distress, extreme anxiety, sorrow, and pain. Tribulation, you know what they used to do in the first century of the history of the church? They used to get Christians and to punish them for their faith, they will put them on a flat surface and then they will get weights and then they will put weights, I mean their hands are tied and then they put heavy weights on their chest and they, they, they can breathe. And they, it, with so much cynicism and, 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 and evil, they will get another weight and put it on top of the person and then another, another weight. And then another wait until their lungs will. That's the word there for tribulation, pressure from without. The other word here, distress, they used to take Christians and they put them in places. And, and little by little, they, will be, they won't be able to sit down or turn or stretch or do anything. They're like this. And little by little, they are making that place closer and closer, pressing against them and, and they, until they, they couldn't move. The, the pain, you know, the whole body cramping and all of that, it was just uh, too much. That's how they used to torture them. But neither, neither one of those things, he says, persecution, verbal or physical abuse, famine, nakedness, extreme poverty, peril, danger of any sort, or the execution or the taking of your life. And here what it says, none of those things, none of them, never is going to separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So don't ever think that I am a child of God. I will never go through problems. That's not the correct view of the Bible. The correct view, I am a child of God. And there might be things in my life that are going to put me through a lot of pain and a lot of persecution and a lot of distress, even famine, <laughs> even the threat of taking my own life. But... In all of those things, I am more than conqueror. That's the correct view of the scripture. In his sovereign purpose, God allows people. I mean, just read about the gospel in Asia, the gospel in, 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 in Afghanistan, in, in, in Iran, in these places. There are hundreds, perhaps thousands of people all over the world that are dying daily for their faith. That's foreign to us because we don't see that yet. But we still have the same assurance. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now, God's great love for you, for us, is supremely demonstrated when Jesus went to the cross to die for your sin. If you ever question, I wonder if God still loves me, just go back to the cross. And there he will say, this much I love you. This much I love you. So, verse 38. <clears throat> Actually, no, what verse are we now? 36, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. What gives you this security? The amazing power of God's love. Paul says, I became persuaded in the past and continue to have a settled persuasion. Or in another way, he says, I have come through a process of persuasion to the settled conclusion that I stand convinced and that I am absolutely sure nothing in this life can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Why so, Paul? Where do you get such strength and such firm conviction? He says, check this out. The Spirit is praying for me. Jesus is praying for me. God is my helper. God is my protector. God is my, def my, my, my provider. God is my defender. And Jesus Christ is my defender all the time, all day long. Any questions? What do we say to that? No, absolutely nothing. And so why do I keep repeating this? Because it must always be clear in my mind. No problem. No persecution, no power, no person can separate me from his love. For his love for you, for me, is eternal. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. He remains my love. And this is, this is something that it really, really got me, not only praying, but even crying. That God loves me so much and that his love for me changes never. Not even when I play the prodigal.
Because my God, in his infinite power and love, is for me. I can say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. Because of my God's infinite power and love, I can say, when I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. Because of my God's infinite power and love, I can say, I have this hope as an anchor to my soul, and it is both sure and steadfast. My God is with me. My God is for me. My God loves me. Paul begins this chapter with no condemnation, and he ended with no separation. There's no doubt that this is one of the most amazing revelations in the whole Bible ever given to man. And we are contemplating the beauty of this blessed assurance. The men are going to come in a second and going to be ready here to serve you the elements of communion. I just want to share a few things here as we close this and see if we can tie this in with the following. I read about this gentleman. I think he, he lived in Scotland years, years, many years ago. His last name I only know. His last name is Kennedy. So this is Mr. Kennedy. And he was, you know, getting up there in age. And when he was about to die, he, his children are sitting around his bed. And they're singing songs and all of that. And then Mr. Kennedy said to one of his kids sitting there, he said, I want you to get my Bible. And the son grabbed the Bible. And he said, I want you to open my Bible to Romans chapter 8, verse 38. Now, his sight was completely gone. He couldn't read anymore. And he says, yeah, it's open to eight, Romans 8, verse 38. He says, grab my finger. And the son grabbed his finger. And he said, put my finger right there on Romans 8, 38. And he says, is there? You sure? Yeah. Your finger is on Romans 8, 38. On this very word, for I am persuaded. And he said, when his son told him that, your finger is right on that word, persuaded. He said, okay, children, listen to me. May the Lord God be with you every day of your lives. I thank God that I was able to have breakfast with you this morning. But I'm out of here because I'm having dinner with Jesus. Then he closed his eyes. And he departed. I was thinking about that. <sighs> because that was not just for Mr. Kennedy. That's for all of us. That you can have. I told that to Pastor Steve. I said, Steve, you make sure that when that moment comes, I have my finger on Romans 838. Because he's younger than me. You know that? The men are going to serve you the elements of communion. And I want you to think about <clears throat> just what it means to have this security, this assurance. Pastor Jeff is going to close us with this beautiful, amazing hymn, Blessed Assurance. And I want you to meditate on that. I read this part of this poem. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I was reading this part that says, when we are walking with the Lord, the future is always bright. It matters not what comes our way when faith replaces sight. And if, if, if that's, I mean, such a beautiful application of Bible truth. And I think it comes from these words here. As the men are serving you the elements because I don't want to keep you holding the elements here for a, for a long time I just want to read these verses I know, I know you'll be able to remember some of these verses <clears throat> and they come out of the 11th chapter in the book of Hebrews and what I love about these verses here is I think that they are the expanded version of Romans 8.38 
And this is what Hebrews 11, 32 says. And what more shall I say? For the time will fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, work righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant, valiant in battle, turned to fly the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain, obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. Listen to this, church. They were stoned. They were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wander about sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wander in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all of these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. The beautiful thing about these verses here in Romans chapter 8 is that no matter what painful situation you might be facing today, Jesus is there to sustain you. That we can go through anything in this life if we know that Jesus is going with us. And because of what Jesus did for us, because of what Jesus did for us, not your performance, not your ability, not your knowledge, not your wisdom, because of what Jesus did for you and me, for us. Number one, because of what Jesus did for you, God's favor make us secure in Christ. Number two, because of what Jesus did for you, God's approval of you is final. There's no appeal to that. God's approval of you is final because of what Jesus did for you. And third, not only that God's favor makes you secure, God's approval of you is final. God's love for you is everlasting. Combine those three, and you can honestly say, we are more than conquerors through him. And of this, I am 100% persuaded, 100% convinced that nothing, nothing in the universe can separate the people of God, from the love of God. Nothing in the universe can separate the people of God from the love of God. As you hold the elements in your hands, I want us to do that with joy, at the same time with the seriousness that the moment requires. More than anything, with thanksgiving in our hearts. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And that's the reality of who we are. The world doesn't define you. Your problem don't, de don't define you. Your health does not define you. Your money does not define you. What defines you is your identity in Christ Jesus. From the moment of regeneration to the moment of glorification is all the work of God. Amen? And so, as we are 
ready to partake of communion here, I want to do it in a way that is honoring to God. And we need to pray about this. Our fathers, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come before you. Lord, as we are about to partake of the elements of communion, we want to do it in a manner that is not unworthy, but in a manner that is honoring to you and that it brings glory. You said, Lord Jesus, do this in remembrance of me. And so it's because of those words that I now ask any person in this room, whether they're sitting here or maybe someone listening to us online, I ask you, my friend, are you persuaded? Are you convinced? No doubts in your heart and in your mind. Because if you're not, I want to give you an opportunity to settle that once and for all. You see, sin separates you from God. It is your sin that separates. And so if you know that there's something that is separating you from God, the Bible says that if you confess, you will be forgiven. Maybe you've never done that. Maybe you've never taken the time to do that. Or well, here's your opportunity to do that. Is there anything in your life that you know that separates you from the holy God of the universe? And that something is called sin. And Jesus came to die for your sin. To pay the penalty of your sin. And to set you free from the power of sin. And one day, free from the presence of sin. But it all begins with justification. Do you by faith believe that Jesus and only Jesus can justify you? And do you want to give Jesus today the opportunity to save you? You can do it with a simple prayer. Now you know that you're a sinner. And you can go to Jesus and you can cry out to him saying, Lord Jesus, I now come to you. I know I am a sinner. Now I know that I am separated and I ask you, Lord, please forgive me of all my sin. Save me, I pray. Rescue me. Be my Savior. And then be the Lord of my life. For I believe that salvation is only in you. And in no one else. Take my life, Jesus. Save me, I pray, in Jesus' name. And so, Father, for all of us, for the rest of us who are just blessed to say that we have an intimate relationship with you, for all of us, every day is communion, as intimacy of communion. But we get to do this in the public matter here. As we are preparing our hearts to partake of the bread and drink of the cup, Lord, we want to thank you for Jesus and the sacrifice of his life, the offering of his life, so that with his precious blood, he will purchase our redemption when he went to the cross to take our place, to die for our sin. Thank you for such grace. Thank you for such amazing love. Thank you for being so merciful to us. And Father, as we eat of this bread, we do this with those words clear in our hearts and in our minds, do this in remembrance of me like Jesus said. So it is in remembrance of Jesus that we thank you and we praise you for his sacrifice as we partake of the bread. And Father, as we are about to drink of the cup, we are reminded of those amazing, beautiful words. What can take away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So we drink of the cup. Just as you instructed us to do. In remembrance of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And that with his blood, he took away our sin. Not just to cover our sin, but he took away our sin forever. And we are saved now. We are set free. And we drink of the cup with thanksgiving in our hearts and praise on our lips 
for that amazing sacrifice. And Father, blessed be your name, now and forever. Thank you for such wisdom. Thank you for, I mean, such amazing promise that you will protect us, you will provide for us. Thank you, Lord, for who you are, and thank you for what you do for us. May your name continue to be exalted and glorified among your people. And as you continue to work among us to make us the church you want us to be and the individuals, the men and the women you want this church to be for, you every day, you will continue to be our strength and our wisdom. And we will live our lives for Jesus Christ. And we will always be careful to give him all honor and all glory. For he is worthy of all. And we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless your church. Amen. Let's all stand. Oh
my story one more time. This is my story. This is my song. Praise my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my Yes, Lord, help us to live our lives for you. Help us to praise you with our words, our actions. Help us to rejoice in all that you've done for us, Lord. Thank you that nothing can separate us from your love. We praise you in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. God bless you guys.